Okay, I'm just going to go briefly over the chapter. To be honest with you, there there's um, not a, a ton of information in the chapter. Um, and I think the hardest part of the chapter is kind of like the questions we did today. At the end, I will answer any questions um, any of you have about what I went over or not. All right, he starts with the production possibilities curve. And all I want to remind you is in the production possibility curve, if we have a straight line like that, it means constant opportunity cost because resources are easily adaptable. So this is constant opportunity cost, resources are easily adaptable. And then if you have the Bode, which is the more common, that's increasing opportunity cost because resources are not easily adaptable, okay? So constant straight line, easily adapted, bowed, increasing, because resources are not easily adaptable. He then goes into talking about specialization and trade. So first of all, countries are gonna specialize in products that they have the lowest opportunity cost. So countries are going to specialize in products in which they have the lowest opportunity cost. It allows them to say make more um, baseballs and then trade them for helmets. If you have the lowest opportunity cost, that is comparative advantage. So lowest opportunity cost gives you comparative advantage, which is what countries are going to specialize and then trade, all right? Those three things drive trade, low opportunity cost, comparative advantage, and specialization. He then talks about absolute advantage, which is the ability to produce more goods, the ability to produce more goods or use the lowest inputs. The ability to produce more goods or use the lowest inputs. For this quiz, I am pretty sure there are no input questions. All right? I mean, there's five different versions of the quiz, but I'm pretty sure no version has input questions, okay? On the test, unit test, you'll need to be able to differentiate, all right? Absolute advantage has nothing to do with trade, all right? So the United States could have absolute advantage in steel and absolute advantage in grain and still trade with Mexico in which both countries benefit, okay? Absolute advantage has nothing to do with trade. He then talked about comparative advantage. All right. Here he defines opportunity cost again. Whatever must be given up, whatever must be given up to obtain something, whatever must be given up to obtain something. And you have comparative advantage if you have the lowest opportunity cost, all right? You have comparative advantage when you have the lowest opportunity cost. Opportunity cost and comparative advantage. Here it is. Comparative advantage for output is the OO. Output equal other over. Output equal other over. So if I was just looking at this poem, like, um, it's hard for me to even see, but I think Perry's on the left. Um, if we were looking at novels, the other is poems 12 over 2. That would be six. If 
But for Jordan novels, 12 over four, that would be three. Three is the s smaller opportunity cost. So that's why Jordan has novels and Perry has poems. Remember, you can have the absolute advantage for both products, but you only could have the comparative advantage for one. Trade is based on the lowest opportunity cost. So you're going to specialize. You are going to specialize in the product with the lowest opportunity cost. Make more of it. So you have some for your country and then trade the rest. Okay. So trade is based on the lowest opportunity cost. You're going to specialize in what you have the lowest opportunity cost. Now, I don't want to the whole Tiger Woods, and maybe in your edition, there's a different person. Here's what you need to know, though. Protectionism, P-R-O, T-E-C-T, I-O-N, I-S-M. Protectionism makes it hard for foreign countries to sell their goods. Protectionism makes it hard for foreign countries to sell their goods. Therefore, this is good for the producers, so good for the country like the United States producers, because they don't have comp competition from foreign countries, but bad for customers, because customers have less choice and tend to have to buy more expensive goods. So protectionism keeps foreign competition out. Good for producers of that country, but bad for consumers because less choice, less and usually higher prices. Should the United States trade? Unless you're given numbers, like we did, like we've been doing with the trade, trade benefits both countries. Trade benefits both countries. They're gonna like to trick you into, like I said earlier, the United States has the absolute advantage in both. Should they still trade with Russia? Yes, because absolute advantage means nothing. Russia is going to have the comparative advantage in one item, and the U.S. is going to have the comparative advantage in the other. So trade will benefit both countries. He then defines imports which are goods produced abroad and sold domestically. Goods produced abroad and sold domestically. That would be like computers built in Japan and sold in the United States. That would be a United States import. We're taking goods that are produced abroad and sold here. Exports are goods produced domestically and sold abroad goods produced domestically and sold abroad. Um, a good example of an export might be corn, all right? So the United States um, raises corn here in the United States and then sells it to the Soviet Union. That would be an export. All right, as far as information goes, that's pretty much what you need to know. Um, are there any questions people have? You could put in the chat either a number on the practice quiz or a question you would like to ask. Okay. All right, whoop, 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 whoop. stop, 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 because I'm getting too many, and then I'll, I'll ask again. I'm going to get to seven in a second. The three, I mean, the things you need to know, Mike, about trade is specialization, opportunity cost, and comparative advantage. The lowest opportunity cost determines comparative advantage. And then countries want to specialize in the product 
that they had the comparative advantage in. Protectionism, um, Kyle, keeps foreign competition out of your country. Keeps foreign competition out of your country. It's good for producers, but not good for consumers. John, it's hard to compare them, but comparative advantage is what determines trade. So I think comparative advantage is the thing you need to determine who should specialize and who trades with who. Opportunity cost is always the best thing you are losing. And the lowest opportunity cost is when, say in this Perry thing, when I do the other over. So if I'm doing novels, the other is 12 over two, that would be a six for, uh, for um, Perry. For Jordan, it would be 12 over four, which would be three. Three is the lowest opportunity cost. So therefore three, um, Jordan would, and that's the end, would um, specialize in novels and Perry and poems. John, did that make sense to you? Everyone who asked the question that I answered, are you clear on it? Otherwise, I'll try again. It's John and yes or no, so I, I'll know. Yeah, okay. I, I'm clear, yeah. Okay, all right, then someone asked for number seven. Let me do number seven and then I will, um, I will again ask. And you guys could see the questions, right? Is that true? Someone just like put on their mic and say yes or no. Yes. Okay. All right. The production possibilities curve illustrates uh, the combination of the output that the economy. So it it would say like how many poems and novels can that country produce? So it'd be C as in Caroline. It's not A because it's not what it should produce. It is what it could produce. Um, the combination of output that economy should consume. It's not about consumption. It's about production. The combination of output that the economy will. I mean, it, it's can. Geez, man, they're really cutting hairs there. Um, but it, it's kind of can produce. All right. Any other questions people have? I'll let stop now. Let me get these and then I'll I'll get again. Is the frontier the whole graph? I Jackson, the production possibilities frontier and the production possibilities curve is the same thing. It's just that graph. It's just called two different things. Ross, I'll get to number five and all right. So two and five. So let me go and do those two. Okay. And then we'll um We'll see, is there anything else you guys want? All right, number five. All right, that's kind of, um, in a way, similar to what we did in class today, just with, okay. If Perry and Jordan spent all their time producing the good in which they have comparative advantage, and trade play takes place at a price of one novel for seven poems, then, okay. Let's see, could I scroll up there? All right. So if Perry and Jordan spend all their time producing the good in which they have, all right. All right. So Jordan is going to spend all their time producing novels. And Perry is going to spend all her time producing poems. All right. Guys, hold on the questions. I'll get to them in a second. I'm going to do two and five, and then I'll, I'll open up for questions again. So here, um, if 
Jordan trades a novel for seven poems. He does better because his ratio is one to three, right? Like if he gives up a novel, he gets three poems. Now he's giving up a novel and getting seven poems. Perry, it's not good for. Because Perry, if they if he gives up six novels, I mean, if he gives up one novel, gives up six poems. But now the trade's asking him to give up seven poems. So therefore, that trade is good for Jordan and not Perry. Ross, did that make sense to you? Yes, thank you. Okay. Then someone asked me for two, and then we'll go to the next one. If the production possibility. Okay. Two is um, what we did in class, but I'll gladly just try to do it here. Um, for every novel Perry gives up, For every novel Perry gives up, or every novel Perry writes, he gives up six poems, and Jordan gives up three. Okay? They both, if they don't write a novel, the maximum amount of poems. Guys, I'll get to everything, but just stop typing them in for a second, because otherwise I get too far back and I might miss one. Okay? Um, if Perry doesn't do a poem, he could do 12. If Jordan, rather, if Perry doesn't do a novel, he could write 12 poems. If Jordan doesn't do a novel, he could write 12. All right, so now I'm looking, I'm, I'm just gonna go to show you the answer, but I'll show you how. The answer is B, all right? So if Jordan writes two novels, that would cost him six poems, right? Because one novel cost him three, Two cost him six. He maximum, if he wrote no novels, is 12. He's losing six. So Jordan could do two and six. Perry doesn't have to write a novel. It's looking at B. They only want two novels, and Jordan's writing them. Why did we pick Jordan to write them? Because Jordan has the comparative advantage in that. All right? So if Perry writes no novels, Perry could write 12 poems. If I add that up, it's two and 18, okay? Now, how to get there, I'd I would have had to go through A and realize that one novel would be 21 poems, and then I would get to B. You have to go trial and error, okay? Uh, who asked for two, by the way? Someone did, I thought. Did I just make that up in my head? Uh, Dylan, does that make sense to you? Yeah, thank you. Okay. All right, good. Could you go over number two? That was good. Can you explain? Uh, John, I don't know what you mean. Can you explain production possibilities frontier? It's the production possibilities curve. So like Perry and Jordan, what they have here, um, and if you want more specifics, if you just wait a second, I'll let you put on your mic and you could tell me. Okay, so Elliot, um, I'm looking at Jordan and Perry here, all right? If Jordan gives up a novel on his own, he gets three poems because one novel equals three poems. So when he trades a novel for seven poems, he's doing better. Perry, for a novel, gives up six poems. So when Perry is trading seven poems for a novel, Perry's doing worse. I decide who's trading what by the comparative advantage. Jordan's going to trade novels because Jordan has the comparative advantage in novels and Perry has it in poems. Elliot, did that help you? Yeah, I did. Thank you. Okay. Billy, six. All right. Let's see. Can we scroll down to six here? 
it's not letting me scroll down. So it's not good. All right, let me see. Let me try this. All right, here we go. Ah, uh, emeralds and rubies. Is this the one? Yes. All right. If the production pass, all right. So first thing here, and by the way, this graph is probably going to, same graph is going to be on your quiz, emeralds and rubies. So the first thing I'm going to look at here is I'm going to divide 240 by eight. And that's going to tell me one emerald is going to equal 30 rubies. So I got that relationship, right? If I did zero emeralds, I mean, zero rubies, I can make eight emeralds. And zero emeralds, I can make 240 rubies. If the production possibility for, is shown for one month of production, then which of the following combinations of emeralds and rubies can be produced in a given month? All right. If I produce seven emeralds, I'm looking at A, right? If I'm producing several emeralds, It's 30 emeralds per, so that would be, it's costing me 210 rubies. The most I can make if I don't trade is 240. So 240 minus 210 would be 30. So I could do seven and 30. That's asking for seven and 40. I can't do that. Five is like 92. There's no way these could be like numbers like that. They're all going to be round numbers, right? It's one, it's like one for third. It's one emerald for every 30. So I'm going to be, you know, subtracting by 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, 210, 240. It can't be 92. Same thing with the five. It can't be a two or a five on this. All right. So now I'm going to go to D, two emeralds would cost me 60 rubies, right? Because 30 for one, 60 for two. 240 is the maximum I can make if I did none, minus the 60, because I made two, it's 30 each. That That is 180. So D is the answer, because I could do D. All right. I forgot who asked for six, but whoever asked for six, are you okay? Um, all right. What is ideally? We did six, we did five. Uh, Billy, does that make sense to you? Billy, maybe you responded somewhere. All right, uh, so people want nine and 11. All right. Okay, let me just clean this up and I'll go down and scroll down to nine and 11. By the way, if I'm going over six, even if you didn't ask it and you don't understand it, You know, check back and ask me to do it again. All right, nine and 11. Let's see, could we get down there? Eight, nine. The gains from trade are results. Okay, so the answer is C. And what that means, the gains from trade occur because I could, re I could specialize in what I'm best at, okay? All right, so as a result of a more efficient resource allocation would be observed in the end. So instead of making something that I have a high opportunity cost, I focus on things that I have a low opportunity cost. I specialize on, on that, and that allows me to trade for things that I'm not as good at, in making. Charlie, did that make sense to you? 
Yeah, the wording is kind of tough, though. Yeah, it is. Um, let me now go to 11. Suppose the United States has a comparative advantage over Mexico in producing pork. The principle of comparative advantage would say the United States should produce Oh, so the answer is A. All right, so the United States has a comparative advantage in pork. It's going to trade pork. So they should produce more pork than what's required in the United States so they could have extra to sell to Mexico and trade with Mexico for whatever Mexico's good at. Max, did that make sense to you? Yeah, that makes sense. Okay. 10. Canada and the United States both produce wheat and computer software. Canada is said to have the competitive advantage in producing wheat. This is 10, right? If the opportunity of producing a bushel of wheat. Okay. So you have the comparative advantage, Elliot, if you have a lower opportunity cost. So Canada and you so Canada is said to have the comparative advantage for B, the opportunity cost of producing a bushel of wheat is lower for Canada than it is for the United States. So that would be if you did the other over and Canada has the lower opportunity cost, so it would have the comparative advantage. Elliot, does that make sense to you? Yeah, you're good. Okay. All right, anything else anyone needs? Austin has one, so I got to try to back backtrack this up. We're getting there, Austin. It's just going to take time. All right. If Jordan works three months to write each novel, then her production possibilities frontier is based on how many months of it. If Jordan works three months to write each novel. Okay, so if Jordan takes three months to write a novel and she could write four novels, she writes four novels. So four times three would give me 12 months and that would be D as in Dogwood. Does that make sense to you? Any other questions that anyone has that they, and I don't care if you're asking for something again, I want you to understand it. Okay. All right, Mike, I'm going to go A and B for two. All right. And I'll go two and six again, okay? So here, comparative advantage is poems, novels. Every um, novel Perry writes is equal to losing six poems. Every novel Jordan writes is the equivalent for three. If Perry writes zero novels, the maximum amount of poems is 12. And that's the same for Jordan. They both could write 12 poems. All right, let's see is A the answer. All right, so Jordan is going to, we're going to specialize in novels. So we're going to take Jordan first. If Jordan writes one novel, that costs three poems. So the maximum is 12. I'm going to take three away. That means Jordan could do one and nine. Okay. Now, I'm trying to see is two novel, rather, uh, we, uh, no, one novel and 22 poems, right? So I've done the novel. So Perry doesn't have to write a novel. Perry could just write 12 poems. 
Well, for one novel, the maximum I could get is 21 poems, nine and 12. So A cannot be the answer. So now I'm gonna erase that and go to B. C is that the answer. And unfortunately, the only way to do this is trial and error, all right? So for B, two novels, again, Jordan's gonna be the person writing novels because they have the comparative advantage. If I do two, if one novel costs me three poems, two novels cost me six. Remember, the max is 12. So I do 12 minus six. So Jordan could do two plus six. The 12 minus six giving me six. Again, Jordan's wrote all the novels. So Perry doesn't have to write any novels, could just concentrate on the 12 poems. Now, if I add these up, it's two novels and 18, so B's the answer. Is that any clearer, Michael? Yeah, yeah, that's better. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right, C. Bass, let me get down to uh, the six here. Let me just clean up the screen. A six to one. Yeah, okay, this is Emerald. All right. So kind of the same in that you got to figure out one Emerald is equal to 30. Right? 30 rubies. If you make zero Emeralds, you could produce 240 rubies. All right, I'm going to look at A to see is that right. All right, if I make seven emeralds, if one emerald costs me 30, seven emeralds cost me 210. Seven times 30 is 210. I take 240, that's the maximum. Seven emeralds cost me 210. That means seven and 30. Now, that's not the answer for A. I could go through B and C, but I got to tell you, just looking at them, nothing could end in two because I'm always going to be minusing like 30, 60, 90, 120, 150, 180, something times 30. And that's not going to end in a two nor a five. All right. So therefore, and you could go through them if you wanted to. Like, and maybe that's just an advantage that I could see it in my head and maybe I should go through it, but, um, uh, all right, so now let me check to see is D the answer, all right? So D is two emeralds. So if I do two emeralds, I have 240, but two is minus 60. 240 minus 60, is 180, and that gives me D as the answer. C bass any better? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anything else anyone else wants to ask? I hope everyone agrees this was an important um, practice quiz to look at. No one? All right. I'm going to be um, in school at 745. If someone wants to go through this, maybe live is a little better. Um, okay. Uh, the video, um, I'll, send, I'll send it out in Remind, and um, I'll send it out through the email, okay, Spiro? I just don't know. Um, actually, let me end the recording now because no one's asking me questions. Uh, I just don't know how long it takes.